Well, hello once again. John Skoll, Savannah to Mark, and right beside me. Social distancing, but the disability law show must go on. That's what we're going to do here today. Among other things we're going to talk about, we'll get to some, uh, some phone calls from our long-running radio show and what your doctor needs to write in a letter to get you or help get you approved for long-term disability. That is all coming up. But to reach out anytime, help at disabilityrights.ca. That's for email, 1-855-821-5900. And a very important website currently and probably will be for the next little while. That would be covidrights.ca. Hey, Savannah, how are you, pal? Good. I'm excellent, John. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm great. Love doing the show. What do you got for me? John, it's been a very busy week again. We're in the middle of this pandemic, and, uh, you know, people are, are slowly getting their bearings. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult time for employees who've been let go from their jobs, uh, but it's also a very difficult time for individuals who are dealing with their long-term disability insurance companies, people who have been denied long-term disability, people who are told that their benefits will be cut off uh, or, or ending uh, uh, very soon or, or have ended already. Uh, and, you know, we are here to provide answers, to go through some cases, uh, some emails that people have sent me with their permission that I am sharing those emails. Uh, let me tell you about this one exchange that I've had this with, with a gentleman out of British Columbia because, you know, we have offices in BC and Ontario and our entire firm is working remotely right now. Everything, everybody's working, everything is going the way that it should from a legal standpoint, at least for us, uh, for the benefit of our clients. So, so this exchange I've had with this individual is that he's had uh, issues with his insurance company, his long-term disability insurer, and he wanted some help. But I found out through this exchange that he also had issues with his employer and he went ahead and he hired an employment lawyer, not someone from our firm, which is absolutely fine, except that now he's interested in potentially hiring us, retaining us to help him with his long-term disability insurer. And, you know, I said to him, we'll be more than happy to help. We can definitely help. But I'm very concerned when I have situations where an individual needs representation on both fronts and then hires two different law firms because, you know, my concern is that things are going to get missed. My concern is that the employment lawyer may not necessarily fully understand the implications of whatever settlement or negotiations are being undertaken with the employer and how that affects the uh, disability side. I'll, I'll give you an example. For, exa you know, for instance, I've had situations with people who have negotiated severance uh, or had lawyers negotiate severance for them with the employer who then find out afterwards that their insurance company gets a credit for that severance. So imagine, John, you let go from your job, you're on LTD, your, your lawyer who doesn't know much about LTD, knows about employment but not LTD, negotiates a fantastic severance package, let's say $50,000, you think it's coming to you, and then you find out, you, you know, you have this realization when the insurance company knocks uh, on the door or calls you or emails you and tells you, wait a second, there is a provision in the LTD policy that says that we get a credit for any severance that you get. So that means that $50,000 doesn't go into the individual's pocket, it actually goes to the insurance company's pocket because they're gonna stop paying you the equivalent of that $50,000. That's one example. There's other examples as well of that interplay between disability law and employment law. So, you know, my point is that it's okay for you to have different representation, different lawyers, but ideally, I think to maximize the benefits to the individuals out there who are facing those dual dilemmas and to maximize uh, the chances that nothing gets missed, you want to make sure you go to a one shop uh, that does everything. You want to go to a law firm that has a focus, a specialization in disability law and employment law, which is exactly what we do. We don't do just disability, we don't do just employment, we do those things. We don't do anything else. We don't do family law, we don't do real estate law, you know, we do employment law and we do disability and injury law. Those are the areas that we focus on and you want to make sure, like I said, that if you have issues on the employment side and the disability side or one or the other, that you go to someone who has expertise in those areas of law to maximize how much money you're going to end up getting in, in, you know, at, at the end of the day in, in your pocket. Anytime you want to go there, disabilityrights.ca is a, a fantastic website. We'll deal with exactly what Savannah has been talking about so far in the show as we just get warmed up here. You can also go there and find how you can catch our radio show, current and past, and past TV shows for that matter. But we take the uh, phone calls from our long-running radio show. We play them here and we talk about them. First call for the day is coming up right now. 
I'm uh, deemed an essential uh, worker right mm-hmm. now doing deliveries. Companies implemented, you know, no contact, but I have underlying health issues. One of those issues my employer is actually aware of based on my weakened immune system with the insurance company pay me disability. I'm concerned also that during this time, I'm going to get the sense that insurance companies are going to be even more cutthroat and they probably would just decline your payment. Do you foresee something like that? Well, here you go, John. You know, you have, again, a dual issue here, the employment side and the disability side. So, so we have two questions here from this individual. L- l- let me answer the first one. The, the fact that this person has, uh, you know, a compromise, uh, I- 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 compromise immunity, uh, a weakened, Im- uh, uh, weakened immune system, does not mean that he's entitled to LTD. You are entitled to LTD if you are unable to do your job because of a disability, because your doctors are saying that you have a psychological or a physical or a mixture of the two, uh, uh, illness or, or injury that prevents you from working. The fact that you are immunocompromised and COVID-19 is out there, that in itself does not mean that you qualify. But if this person develops depression, uh, high levels of anxiety, whatever other illnesses, uh, his psychologist or family doctor, whoever's treating him, says because of those illnesses, he's unable to work, he's disabled from working, and here's why. Well, then he should qualify for LTD. So that brings me to the second question he asked, which is that his concern is that you know, insurance companies are going to be a lot more cutthroat. Well, here's the thing. Insurance companies operate on one very simple principle. It's the principle of fear. They want you to be afraid, afraid of applying, afraid of, of them telling you to do something and you're not compliant with what they say, afraid of challenging them if they cut you off or deny your claim. This idea of fear is born out of the fact that they are billion dollar entities, right? These insurance companies. But here's the thing, and here's the secret. As soon as you break through that fear, as soon as, and as soon as you understand that you have certain rights and, and we can help you enforce those rights, they capitulate. They, they, they back off. You know, John, we've had over the last few weeks so many situations where people have hired us after trying to appeal denial, denial after denial, and we get involved, and after sending a letter or two or, or starting a legal claim, they back off. They want to come and talk settlement, or they want to reinstate the individual and put them back on claim. How do you explain that? The only way to explain that is that these insurance companies are calculating that the majority of people are going to think the way that this caller just did, which is that you can't challenge an insurance company, they're going to be more cutthroat, it's very difficult, it's not. It's actually a lot easier than you think to challenge an insurance company because at the end of the day, they're not looking for the fight. They win the fight at the beginning. They win the fight if they can make you think that you shouldn't fight. As soon as you stand up for your rights or you have us help you stand up for your rights, we are the ones dealing with the insurance company, we are the ones pushing back, we're the ones hitting them and forcing them to pay you what they owe you. I mean, that's the reality. The reality is the insurance companies don't want to fight these fights. It costs them money. They have to pay their lawyers. They don't want to pay their lawyers. They didn't become billion dollar corporations by paying thousands of lawyers indefinitely. No. They make all this money by collecting premiums and then betting that the majority of people, John, will simply not challenge them when they deny their claims unjustly. And you see, you know, it's funny you say they're, they're there and they will pay out. And I think this is something that you and, and James, your partner, have said that just because everyone's locked away at home, these insurance companies are open and they're doing business. If not, they're doing it more swiftly than before the pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah they're doing business. I mean, one of the first things that happened when the pandemic happened and everybody started working from home is we, we, we got word from, from all of the major insurance companies across the country that they are still doing business for them it's business as, as usual, meaning that they are dealing with claims, they are paying out claims, th- they are working with us. They understand that at the end of the day, even if they try and block us, this is a temporary thing. Once all the courts are functioning the way they did pre-COVID, they're going to have to pay anyway. So they understand that. They also understand that the longer they drag it out, the more they're going to have to pay down the road. So, you know, they're not stupid. They understand what's happening here. So, yeah, they're in business. They're still collecting premiums. I mean, check your credit card, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for those payments. You, you, you know, you're, you're paying for house insurance. You're paying for car insurance. You're paying all this insurance. They're paying out. They're still in business. We're still working with them. Do not give up. And, and the one thing I will say, John, most people, many people don't give up, but they wait. They wait unnecessarily before contacting us. And, you know, I've had people contact me saying I was denied last year. Well, guess what? Had you contacted me when you were first denied, I would have already resolved your case for you. 
And now all that you've done is you've delayed the resolution of your case by a year because it took you a year to come to me. So, you know, don't wait. It costs nothing to talk to us. We'll give you the answers you need. And then you can decide how you want to proceed. But don't wait and do not be afraid of the insurance company. All right, coming up here, what your doctor needs to write in a letter to help get you approved for LTD. That is on the way, but we'll take a wee break first. In the meantime, 1-855-821-5900 is the number. COVIDrights.ca is a good uh, website to check out anytime. And help at disabilityrights.ca for email as well. Disability Law Show, lots more is on the way. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All righty, welcome back. Disability Law Show. Good, uh, glad you hung around. Lots more to come here. You want to reach out to, uh, by the way, covidrights.ca is a very complex and robust website. Really, uh, really important now just based on the name covidrights.ca. It'll tell you all kinds of information about this pandemic and how it deals with you, your insurance, and your disability as well. But uh, something that, that's always there, a big stumbling block for you guys, or at least for insurance companies, or at least they use this one, Savannah, is, you know, insufficient medical uh, information. You know, the stuff that your doctor has given us is not complex enough. So I'm going to ask you this, and I know you want to talk about these points, what your doctor needs to write in that letter to help you get disability, long-term disability approved. What do you think? Okay, so first of all, uh, you're absolutely right, John. Insurance companies need this information, and I have seen quite a few cases getting rejected because the insurance company takes the position there's insufficient medical documentation supporting your disability or some kind of language uh, in that regard. Now look, in many instances, when I look at the documentation that the insurance company got from the doctor, it's 100% sufficient. The doctor talks about the treatments, they talk about the diagnosis, they talk about everything. But in some instances, I can tell you, John, that I have understood why the insurance company denied the claim. Look, you cannot give the insurance company uh, a napkin with a one-liner on it that says this person is disabled and then expect the insurance company to approve you for LTD. That's not enough. So when people ask me, well, what does my doctor need to write? What does my psychologist need to put down? I'm going to give you the basic structure of what I ask doctors to write. And one of the things that I want to make sure people understand is I never, ever tell a doctor, here's the conclusion I want you to put down on paper. That's not my job. My job is to simply explain to the medical professional what it is that the insurance company is looking for, what information they need. So, for example, I'll start off by asking the doctor, how long have you been the claimant's doctor? Or if you're a psychologist, how long have you been this person's psychologist? A year, two years, five years? Let me know. Obviously, John, if you have someone who's been training you know, the claimant for five years, it's a lot more powerful and persuasive to get an opinion from that person than someone who's seen your, your client, your patient, uh, for, for just you know, one time. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I ask for a diagnosis. Now remember, the fact that you have a diagnosis is great, but it doesn't mean that if you don't have a diagnosis that the insurance company automatically rejects your claim, or, or they should. I have never seen an LTD policy that requires a claimant to have a diagnosis in order to be approved for LTD. Remember, medicine is, is still limited in, in certain capacities. We don't know everything. The doctors don't know everything. I mean, COVID-19, you know, case in point, we're still learning about many of these things. But if there is a diagnosis, I would like the doctor or the health practitioner to put down on paper what is the diagnosis. I would like also this individual, the, the, whoever's treating the individual who's writing the report, to write down what are the treatment recommendations and then confirm if the individual has in fact been following the treatment recommendations. That's important. 
because many times insurance companies will be very skeptical as to whether or not a person actually follows the recommendations of the doctor, of the physiotherapist, the psychologist. You want to make sure that there is no question, no question out there that you have been following whatever your doctors have been telling you to do. Now this is really, really key. Whoever's treating you should be speaking about any functional limitations you may have. This is important. It's not enough to say this person is depressed, John. The psychologist needs to outline, well, how is this depression affecting this person's ability to do things, whether it's around the home, whether it's at work, whatever it is, right? I mean, the insurance company needs to understand not only that the person is sick or, or injured, but how is that sickness or injury affecting their ability to do their job? Right? You can have a factory worker uh, that, that has a knee injury and then you can have somebody who has a sedentary position that has a knee injury. That injury may affect those individuals differently. Right? It may, it may uh, disable the factory worker from working at the factory. It may not disable the person who's working by a desk all day from working by the desk. So it's important that the individual who writes the letter explains mm -hmm. what are the functional limitations as a result of the injury or the illness. Now, this is also important. I ask for a prognosis. And I understand that doctors and other practitioners, they don't have a crystal ball. You may not know how this person is going to be in terms of being able to, to work or not in a year, and two years. So it's okay to say for the foreseeable future if that's in fact the case. Very, very important to understand that the insurance company is seeking this information so they can make an assessment as to whether or not your patient, the claimant, should in fact be on LTD or not. And, and it depends also where you are on the LTD timeline, right? Are you dealing with your own occupation or any occupation? Now, John, on the weekend when we did this show, this past weekend, uh, my colleague James Fireman was on and I had gone through all of these uh, factors here and these things that I want doctors to write. And he made a few excellent points that I just want to touch on. Number one, we respect doctors' time. We understand, especially during this pandemic, doctors don't have time. So thank you for helping your patients with this. You know, we understand that there are time constraints, so you do the best you can to provide whatever information you can to the insurance company. And John, I have spoken myself personally, and James has as well, to countless doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, who have had questions about their own patients and their own patients' difficulties with insurance companies. Again, they've never told us their names, there's confidentiality issues, of course, we deal with those. But the point is, we assist health practitioners all the time navigate these kinds of questions with insurance companies. The other point that James had made, which is very important, is if you are going to your doctor and asking for this letter, be very careful of telling your doctor, my lawyer told me I need to get this. And the reason I say that is because the doctor may very well write that in the report, that the lawyer asked for it, when really the reason why you need that letter or report is because of the insurance company. But the appearance of, of having this in the notes, it, it, may, it may cast doubt or, or may, may cast credibility issues on, on the report. So, so I'm very careful of telling my, my clients, look, get these, this information from your doctors, get this report, but, but you know, don't frame it as me, the lawyer, is asking the doctor to say X, Y, and Z. That's not, that's not what's happening here. All we need is to make sure that we facilitate as lawyers the communication between the doctor or the health practitioner and the insurance company because the last thing we want is for the insurance company to deny a claim on the basis of a miscommunication. And oftentimes, John, when we get into the picture and we see this miscommunication and we repair it, we help the two sides converse, that's when the insurance company actually says, aha, we made a mistake, the person should actually be paid. So, so it's important, but you know, again, if you have questions about your situations or loved ones, or if you're a doctor or a psychologist or anybody else who's treating someone and you're having issues of this nature and questions about how to deal with the insurance company's requests, please feel free, give me a call, email me. It's gonna cost nothing, nothing to speak to one of us on my team. All right, pal, good stuff. We'll take a, a quick pause here coming up. Can you be cut off your LTD if your claim for CPP is rejected? We will tackle that after a short break. In the meantime, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca to reach out through email as well. It's a disability law show. Stick around. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors, they've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. 
we're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900 or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Welcome back. Disability Law Show reaching out any time to Savannah or James. A member of the team is really simple. Help at disabilityrights.ca. 1 855 821 5900 is the good old phone number, and the website covidrights.ca is up and running. And you should have a look at that, especially during this pandemic time. Covidrights.ca. But you want to catch the radio show, you go to disabilityrights.ca, find a station near you that carries it. And listen in each week. We've been doing it for years. We get lots of great phone calls, lots of wonderful questions out there. And we'll play back our second call from the radio show right now. So I've been on long-term disability for over a year. And my insurer told me to apply for CPB disability a while ago. I got rejected. And now my adjuster is saying that my benefits are going to end in June. I don't get it because my doctors keep saying that I'm not ready to go back to work. And I'm not. What can I do? I need the money for my family and can't go back to work. John, again, not uncommon to see this. So let's break this down. First of all, the reason why insurance companies, uh, long-term disability insurers, want you to apply for CPP disabilities is because they get a credit for any amount you end up getting from CPP disability. So the simplest example is you're getting, let's say, three grand a month from LTD, from your LTD insurer. You applied for CPP disability, you got approved, Let's say you're getting $1,000 a month from CPP disability. You're not getting 1,000 plus 3,000 for four. You're getting still 3,000, but now the insurance company doesn't have to pay you three. They only have to pay you two because the other 1,000 you're getting from CPP disability. Now, the, tests for, the test for getting CPP disability is different. You have to demonstrate that you have a, a, a disability that is both severe and prolonged. Arguably, this is my position and many of my colleagues' position, that test is actually more difficult to meet than the test of total disability for long-term disability. Nonetheless, what often happens, which is what happened here with this gentleman, unfortunately, is that the insurance company who's paying you LTD will look at what the government has now done. The government has rejected your CPP disability application and they'll say, oh, the government doesn't think you're disabled under their criteria, so therefore we're going to cut you off. That is completely wrong. They cannot do that. They do that, but they cannot do that. And the thing is that many people think that, in fact, getting rejected by CPP disability means automatically that they should be cut off or will be cut off or could be cut off LTD. Those are two separate programs, okay? You can get LTD and not qualify for CPP disability. I've also seen situations, by the way, where, uh, this is interesting, where a person is getting CPP disability and still got cut off by the LTD insurer, and then the LTD insurer on those cases says, well, but it's a different test. The fact that the person gets CPP disability doesn't mean they qualify for LTD. So you see, the insurance company will use whatever they can depending on the circumstances. My point is, there should absolutely be no reason to cut off someone L uh, off of LTD just because that person got rejected for CPP disability. And by the way, many individuals who get rejected for CPP disability end up appealing that decision with the government and end up getting CPP disability. So the fact that your application initially, at first instance, was denied does not mean you're not disabled, obviously, as many people know. So, John, we can help this gentleman. It's not going to be actually very difficult to resolve uh, because if the insurance company, in fact, cut him off or will be cutting him off as a result of his rejecting from CPP disability, that's not a good enough reason, and they're going to have a big, big problem when we start a legal claim, and they have to explain themselves. I'm telling you, we can get the insurance company to the table fairly quickly in that case. And I, I don't think there's a negative to applying to CPP disability in, in the first place. I mean, number one, if your insurance company asks you to do it, you do it. Plus, yeah. secondly, if you end up getting cut off LTD and you've been approved for CPP, at least you still got that money coming in, right? You have another income source. You're absolutely right. There's a bunch of benefits for getting CPP disability if, in fact, you are disabled. You're absolutely right, John. Uh, and 
you know, you're also correct, obviously, that, you know, not only is that, is, is, do you have that benefit, but it makes it that much more difficult for the insurance company to argue that you're not disabled because you can always come back and say, well, the government says that I'm disabled, right? Use that argument against them. And, and it sort of dissuades them from, you know, even going down that road. So you're absolutely right. And if they ask you to apply for CPP disability and you don't, what may happen is that they, they may estimate how much they think you should be getting and then reduce your monthly LTD amounts accordingly. So, you see, you should be applying for CPP disability if you are getting LTD. I want to try to uh, slide an email in there, uh, brother. It's from help at disabilityrights.ca, by the way, is the email address at any time for you as well. Uh, Dina says, I've been suffering uh, from arthritis for over 10 years and it's got progressively worse. I've worked as a chef in one of the top restaurants in the city for over 30 years and I have private long-term disability insurance that I purchased years ago and have been paying for ever since. Since the pandemic started, I've had a lot of anxiety and my doctor says I have depression. He referred me to a psychologist and after one session, that psychologist confirmed that I can't work because of my depression. My arthritis is also pretty bad and my rheumatologist also said that I can't work because of my arthritis. I'm thinking that I should apply for LTD, long-term disability, but I'm afraid I'll get declined. Should I even bother applying? Absolutely. Yep. D John, this goes back to what we said at the, uh, the beginning of the show, which is that fear is what grips most people. Yeah. Uh, it prevents people from applying. It prevents people from fighting back. Do not be afraid. Listen, I'm telling you this as somebody who used to work for insurance companies. And now we have a new lawyer on our team, by the way, that you know, we spoke about before, John, Tamara Gopian, who used to be one of the top lawyers for one of the biggest insurance companies here in the country. And she'll tell you the exact same thing. Anybody, anybody that I know that has done defense work, that has defended insurance companies, will tell you it's a mirage. Okay, they're putting a mirage in front of you. They're making you think that there is this huge big wall that you can't climb once they deny your claim. Don't, don't think that way. I'm telling you, you know, Dina is, I understand her fear here, but look, she did the right thing. She got private insurance, but she has a psychologist, she has a rheumatologist, she has doctors saying she can't work. This is what she paid premiums for. If you have a car accident and you paid premiums and you have insurance, shouldn't you claim for that car, right? I mean, if you need to replace the car or if you need to have it written off or whatever, or, or repaired, of course, that's what, you, that's what you have insurance for. If you have a leak in your basement and you have house insurance, shouldn't you call your insurance company? Of course you should. That's what you have insurance for. It's supposed to be a safety net. That's the same thing with disability insurance. Whether you paid for it privately, Dina, or whether it's through work, whether your employer pays for it, doesn't matter. If you are disabled from working, do not be afraid. Go to your doctors, get the letters that we spoke about earlier in the show, get the information on those letters that explain the nature of your disability, what is prohibiting you from work or disabling you from work, and give it to the insurance company, make the application. And look, if you get denied, it's not the end of the world. Contact me, let me know. Let me review the application or the deny letter. Let me take a look at the, at the, the letters you, you gave the insurance company. I'll tell you within a minute on the phone if you have a case or not. That's the thing, John, people don't understand. It's not a huge thing for us to be able to assess whether or not someone has a case. And in some cases, some situations, we tell someone, listen, the insurance company is correct. You don't have a case, you know? But in other situations, we'll tell you, you have a case. What you want to do with that information is up to you, but do not be afraid, please. That's the only, that's the only thing, if there's only one message here, mm -hmm. do not be afraid of an insurance company. They want you to be afraid. If you are afraid and you get paralyzed by that fear, you are playing into their hands. That's the reality. I've seen this when I was working on the other side. And I'll tell you this, it's not just individuals, John, who, who are afraid. It's, it's, also, it, it's also lawyers. I've seen uh, lawyers that do what I do that get scared by the insurance company. If you have a lawyer like that, good luck to you. You want a lawyer, a firm that's going to go after the insurance company no matter what. Whatever happens, do not be afraid. Let me know what your situation is. Get somebody uh, to, you know, to review your case, whether it's me or someone else. But, but just don't, don't, don't you know, back off. You have rights. Those rights have not been suspended by this pandemic. Go after what you are owed. Well said, man. We'll, uh, we'll leave it at that for another week. You want to reach out to Savannah or James or Tamar, for that matter, their newest lawyer or a member of the team. It's really simple. 1-855-821-5900 is the phone number. COVIDrights.ca, as mentioned, there's a lot of information there you want to check out. COVIDrights.ca. Email address is help at disabilityrights.ca and shorten that just down to disabilityrights.ca to check out the website as well. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time. Disability Law Show.